Okay. In the last two readings, the new critical and the reader response, I've lingered with some difficult elements of Robinson's poem, but I have nevertheless managed to find uh, what I might call the center of the poem's meaning, or at least the center of my sense of its meaning. Uh, if I were a post-structuralist, uh, specifically a deconstructivist, however, I would reject any attempt to find the poem's center of meaning. It's what I often sort of teasingly call uh, uh, alluding to uh, or citing uh, one of my favorite teachers, its inner hidden deeper secret meaning. Instead, I would affirm that there is no center to the poem's meaning, that I could, if I wished, begin my reading of the poem from anywhere in the poem, attending to how, with just the right, just the right pressure, its meanings tend to slide, creating instances of what um, deconstructivists, what Jacques Derrida might call undecidability. And what is undecidability? Simply, or not so simply, moments of textual slippage in which two or more meanings are kind of equally possible. Uh, this is related to ambiguity, but is more extreme in the sense that it cuts off the possibility of resolution from the get-go. Last semester, uh, when I taught this same course, although in a very different way, I posted a video or two explaining the tendencies, what I was calling the tendencies of a deconstructive, uh, deconstructive literary criticism. Um, uh, I, draw, I draw these tendencies in those videos from Jonathan Culler's classic work, I actually have it right here, um, on deconstruction. It's a, it's a great book. Someday I might, might actually teach it. Um, we'll see. I don't know what sort of class I would teach it in, but anyway. Um, I, I want to go over those tendencies here, but I'll try to reduce them down uh, so that they're intelligible, but also also brief, so we can uh, get get to the tech back to the text. All right. Deconstructivists are are often on the lookout for what what we might think of as logical pairings, right? Male, female, human, animal, um, um, up, down, white, black, presence, absence, right? Any kind of pairing. Um, uh, and what, the, what they do with those pairings in, in literary texts and other texts is to show how those pairings or those um, binaries are not um, neutral ones, but there's a, that there's a great deal of value uh, invested in, in those pairings and that those pairings aren't equal, but are always in some sense placed in a kind of hierarchy, right? The first um, item in each of the uh, examples I just gave, male, up, white, uh, presence, right? that these all carry a kind of positive connotation in the wider culture, whereas the second terms, historically and culturally, have not carried much of a positive connotation for ethical, political, philosophical, conceptual reasons, reasons that often go unacknowledged right, in everyday discourse. So uh, the most common procedure in deconstructivist criticism is to point out uh, pairings that might not seem very obvious, um, show how they are not neutral, how there's actually a lot of implicit value um, that locks them into a kind of uh, hierarchy, how one of them is favored over the other. Um, but also then, and this is the more interesting part, what it tries to do is show moments in which that hierarchy is unintentionally flipped, right? Where the minor term actually begins to kind of take over uh, the, the major term, okay? And I'll show that a bit in, um, in Robinson's poem. Okay. So that's the first thing that deconstructivists tend to do. The second thing they do is invent new terms for those, those moments in which the text reverses, re reverses itself or resists itself, right? Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend this kind of inventing new terms uh, for us in this class, but if you ever venture into the work of Derrida, uh, to know that that is often what he's doing, coining new words in order to describe the processes he's studying or claims to be noticing, um, can be helpful, right? That a lot of his terminology really exists side by side as near synonyms of each other, right? The trace, the supplement, difference, and, and so many others, right? Um, anyway, for those interested in Derrida, I'll be happy to, to talk about those. Um, or you could go look at my videos that I posted a year ago on his book of grammatology. 
The third thing uh, uh, is what is often called reading against the grain of a text, seeking out moments where the text differs from itself, thus deferring its own meaning, right? De deferring the stability of its own meaning. Um, and so instead of critiquing a work of art for things that seem to be out of place, right, that don't seem very harmonious with the rest of the text, um, a deconstructivist might ask, well, what if we treat those moments, right, as significant, right? Instead of dismissing them as flaws or errors, what if we imbue them with a sort of like extra, um, extra ability to turn the text against itself? One of the most common ways in which someone might do this is to read a moment, uh, to read moments in a way that seems to go against how the text itself frames them. Um, reading a figure reading a figure of speech or an instance of figurative language literally right or reading a literal moment as if it were a figure of speech or the use of a trope right overall reading against the grain means betraying the codes of interpretations that interpretive communities that i as part of a contemporary community interpretive community um, have inherited the fourth thing deconstructivist critics tend to do is investigate moments of self-reflection in a text, to treat neutral passages that seem to be about something else as if they were about the actual text, right? As if they were a kind of commentary woven into uh, the literary text itself. In some sense, this is not all that different from new critics who often read poems as if they were theoretical reflections on poetry. And Ro Robinson's poem, which ends with the poor poet waking up, um, can show us why, because poems are often about poems. Uh, the fifth thing is that deconstructivists sometimes read literature as if it is already staging various interpretations of itself. Right? This works better in novels, I think, um, but it's pretty interesting to consider how one can see uh, different characters in a novel, for instance, kind of standing in for uh, standing in for a mode of reading or an attitude uh, linked with a kind of interpretation that will later be brought to, brought to the novel itself. And right, so we'll talk more about this when we get to Ellen Hollinghurst's *The Line of Beauty*. How various characters in the novel can be thought of as anticipating, right, um, psychoanalytic criticism, queer criticism, feminist criticism, new criticism, or or some other sort of engagement with the text. Right? The sixth thing, probably the most basic way in, in which deconstructivists um, engage with texts, is to emphasize or centralize, heuristically, uh, marginal moments. Um, uh, instead of attending to what seems like the most important thing in a text, in other words, a uh, deconstructivist might linger with moments that seem rushed, moments that, uh, um, moments that seem to be brushed into uh, the dark, darker corners of the text, right? or that seem underdeveloped. How might our understanding of the text change if we refocus our interpretation around minor moments or marginal moments or peripheral moments like this? Okay. So those are six ways uh, uh, in which uh, deconstructivists tend to engage with literary texts. So where might I pursue something like this, something like a deconstruction, like deconstruction, in my reading of Robinson's poem? If we return to the last image of the poem, the poet who wakes to paint the summer morning, and learn to think about pairs of terms as non-neutral and value-laden, if I slide my way into reading as a deconstructivist, I see that a strange opposition between seeing and hearing is set up in, in uh, Robinson's poem, and that there is a strange privileging of seeing over hearing. After all, the poem depicts, depicts things visually far more than it depicts the sound that we are supposed to hear. The din is not a cacophony at all, really, but a vivid description, a visual description, of things that one might see. Take the chimney boy, for instance, quote, on the pavement hot, the sooty chimney boy with dingy face and tattered covering shrilly hawks his trade. There's only one allusion to noise in this description. All the others are visual. Um, besides one description of feeling, right? The hot pavement. But we won't go into that now. To paint, the, 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 the figure of painting in the final image then becomes interesting and interested. 
for it suggests that a visual aid is needed to give some sort of order to the otherwise unintelligible noises of London. To write, the activity for which painting is a figure, likewise is also to give some sort of order, an order that is graphic, like painting, inscribed, written down, and experienced by readers with their eyes. Oddly enough, um, the poem, far from a poem about the sounds of a London summer morning then, insists that we learn to hear London with our eyes. But then again, language is not just written. Right? In fact, it is written so that it can presumably be spoken, so that it can be heard. By rendering this summer morning as a poem rather than a painting, the poor poet does what neither a painting, visual, nor the din itself, audible, can do. She slides back and forth between sight and sound, prompting reading and reciting, seeing and listening. If I were a deconstructivist, I might posit this as my thesis, that the poem is largely about the synesthetic drama of our sensuous capacities to see and hear, how there is an undecidability at play between these senses when it comes to our engagement with literature and with the world. What we see and what we hear are not so easily distinguishable, although we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking that what we see um, uh, is more immediately apparent than what we hear. But there is another thing a deconstructivist might point out, that while the end of the poem suggests that the poem is able to withdraw from the city in order to capture the city, that the literary itself, the poem, provides the point of view from which to record in song, in writing, in verse, the details of the city, that this suggestion of an ability to withdraw from the din in order to make sense of it is a complete ruse. The poet can only master the din or play at being a master of the din by becoming a part of the din, by becoming part of the noisy mass that she experiences. Indeed, the poet is already part of this, of this messy din, right? Remember, she wakes up from busy dreams, right? Not from rep careful or restful repose into a busyness, but from one busyness to another. Moreover, she is poor, like the chimney boy, hawking her trade, like the trunk maker, trying her hand at alluring goodies, like the pastry chef. She expresses the chaotic din best not by encompassing all of it from the outside and reordering it, but by contributing a song to it, adding her poem and her voice and her verse as a supplement to that which can never quite be experienced as fully present. Right? That even when we rapidly accumulate all the various jobs, it's difficult to experience them all at the same time as fully present to ourselves. In this way, Robinson's poem extends the linguistic lesson of deconstruction, that meaning slides, that even when we try to be precise with our language, that we are really just getting good at hiding language's slipperiness, that what we mean most to say will always become deferred and thus different from itself. The poem extends this, these linguistic lessons to sensuous experience itself. We speak what we see. We will believe only with our eyes, not what we are told yet we are shocked by what we hear. That that which we see will always turn into sound, sound into sight. That the contents and operations of senses are, in a sense, undecidable, non-locatable, blunt and awkward tools with which we try to make something present to ourselves. As Derrida famously writes in an essay called Signature Event Context, let me see if I can find it, I shall even extend this law, meaning the, the lessons I've just rehearsed, to all experience in general, if it is conceded that there is no experience consisting of pure presence, but only chains of differential marks. Right? So there Derrida is claiming that the activity of sensing things with our, see with our eyes, with our ears, is in some sense no different than attempting to record them with marks on the page or with paint on a canvas, right? That, that those are the only ways in which we can grapple with um, the world through experience. Okay. 
So we'll pause there and quickly go through some some things about new historicism, and also um, try to try to review and rehearse and summarize the lessons we've learned from these different modes of engagement. Okay. So, new historicism. Uh, if I am a new historicist, um, this would be difficult to demonstrate. Um, if I were a new historicist, I might affirm the post-structuralist challenge to any border that one might try to put around the text. I would affirm that meaning, the meaning I make in my engagement with the text is informed by larger contexts, larger discourses, ways of seeing and speaking that pre-exist me, and in which I have been enculturated. I would affirm that the same is true for the author, and for the author's original audience. I would affirm that this non-bracketability of the text from other texts makes it possible to link up the literary with the non-literary and to do a kind of historical inquiry that would enliven the literature and enliven the non-literary by making them resonate together. For instance, a new historic, as a new historicist, I might notice the same sort of things I noticed were I a new critic or reader response or risk critic or deconstructivist, but I might look to unexpected documents to help draw out some compelling insights or surprisingly unnoticed implications to how or what a poem means and even how it has survived. But how does one go about finding historical sources? By reading modern histories. That's sort of the easiest way to do it. By noting the sources that, are, that those histories draw from. By going to those primary sources and tracking down whatever sources they are drawing from or what texts or ideas they are hopefully citing. Some examples of modern histories that might be of some use in doing a new historicist reading of this poem are the Cambridge Economic History of Modern England, which is two volumes, right? In fact, a new edition just came out this year. Might also look at an older history, Hano Hanoverian England, 1714 to 1808. Um, this is written by George Rude, right, and contains a great deal of empirical research that would be of a great deal of interest to us. Might also look at something that was published a few years after Rude's history, a, a new historical geography of England after 1600. Um, so uh, since it was published in 76, it's not so new, but again, it might be a possible source for finding primary, um, 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 primary sources. Um, contemporary with Robinson's poem. One could also look at any history of London itself as a city, or look at resources having to do with urban development, right? Urban development or urban diversity. There's a ton of this sort of stuff out there. Okay. One well-known contemporary source that might be of some value, one that's cited uh, frequently in this, in this literature, um, uh, some value in thinking through the contextuality of A London Summer Morning is Thomas Malthus's 1798 treatise, An Essay on the Principle of Population. It's a long work, easily accessible online, that addresses a problem still somewhat pretty relevant to us, right? The problem of material goods in a world of rapidly expanding population and what this means for the economic welfare of the population as a whole. In short, um, for poverty, widespread poverty. Since poverty is a rather important component of his argument, it certainly seems relevant to Robinson's poem. In what other ways might we make these two texts resonate, right? And so someone might go through and, and think about the kind of um, pairings or binaries or comparisons the poem makes and see in what way might, might Malthus's essay also do the same thing, though maybe not in a straightforwardly literary way. In my archival digging, I might also bring my deconstructivist obs observations about seeing and hearing to the documents I investigate. In what ways are the poor represented? With visual imagery or with descriptions of sounds? When the poor are not represented directly, in what ways do they haunt the margins of these historical documents? Visually or as cries that are shuffled to the periphery, outside the consideration of big, important events? So these are all questions that I'm sort of more anticipating a new historicist reading of the poem, um, since I don't really have time to synthesize uh, synthesize um, uh, the observations of all the literature I just mentioned, only one of which was a contemporary document uh, or contemporary to the poem itself here, right? Written in 1794, Malthus's essay is 1798, 
Um, so you'd want to find a few more sources written around the time, perhaps a bit more obscure, um, maybe even some letters uh, of people describing uh, London summer mornings, if you can find them. All right, I think that's enough. I just want to end with a few observations. This video is going to be the longest one. Um, uh, sorry, sometimes I just look at myself and I think like, wow, that's you. Okay. These poor people having to look at you talk, talk this whole time. Anyway, um, first, as a new critic, I managed to, de develop, to develop a rather interesting reading of how the poem resolves the initial tension between the common noises of London and the uncommon song of verse. Two, as a reader response critic, I managed to investigate the gaps between the real reader, me, and the ideal reader, an 18th century, late 18th century Londoner, noticing that the poem might actually be enjoining those who are, like me, seeing a London summer morning this way for the first time, namely those who are absent from the poem itself. As a deconstructivist, I read the poem as a synesthetic drama of sight and sound, in which the source of what we sense, whether by seeing or hearing, remains undecidable. Fourth, anticipating a new historicist reading, I suggest uh, ways in which to take what I learned in these initial approaches to non-literary texts, to the archive of documents uh, contemporary with Robinson, in order to see how her poetry might be negotiating, to use Stephen Greenblatt's term, with larger discourses that are in the air at the time. By reading the poem in this way, we might actually gain some sort of insight into a larger cultural poetics. Okay. All right, so I, I, that's the end of these <laughs> lectures. Uh, I hope that was useful to some of you who may be struggling to keep separate these different modes of criticism. Uh, and if any of you need a little bit of help with the terminology uh, often associated with these modes of criticism, I'll be happy to talk about those either uh, via email or in office hours or in class if there are questions. So, all right. Well, um, if you watch this before Tuesday, I'll see you Tuesday. If you watch it after that, I'll be seeing you soon. Okay.